Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Move Up Days officially kicked off in Lethbridge. The fun began with a colorful parade which rolled through the downtown core. As many Canadians are still finding things tough financially, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation explains how much we're paying in taxes at the pumps. And with the potential of a Canada-wide rail strike, could the federal government invoke back-to-work legislation? Political commentator Brian Lilly will offer his thoughts. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, it's an event we've been waiting a long time for, all summer long. Whoop Up Days officially began here in Lethbridge. The summertime festival kicked off with the Whoop Up Days parade earlier on Tuesday morning. As BCN's Naveen Day reports, the floats, horses and displays were all out in full force, along with a very special animal you don't usually see at a parade. <laughs> For Lethbridge, this is the greatest thing that's happened this year. Well, if you live in Lethbridge, there are three words you've been hearing a lot lately. Those three words, Whoop Up Days. And to kick off the event was the Whoop Up Days parade held on Tuesday morning. Before the parade kicked off, I had a chance to chat with this year's parade marshal, Dwayne Kessler. You know, I've been a part of the Lethbridge exhibition for over 50 years, and for them to think of me in such a capacity is, like I said, very overwhelming. Here are some highlights from Tuesday morning's parade. While the floats are always a hit with the spectators, they shared with me what they really look forward to. I love the horses. The horses. Can't beat the horses. The horses. Horses and pretty ladies. Come on now. And while there were an abundance of horses to be seen, there was one animal that stole the show. Check out this bison. It was also a chance for local clubs to show off their skills. Always expected at parades, dignitaries were in attendance. They included Lethbridge MP Rachel Thomas, Alberta NDP leader Nahed Nenshi, and Alberta Premier Daniel Smith. I think I've been here every year for the last few years and I want to keep on coming back because you get to meet members of the community, find out what's on their mind, talk to local council members, see some really amazing floats, lots of horses in the parade. It was my first time in the Whoop Up Days parade. Uh, and the reception we got on the streets was incredible. And Bridge City News didn't just cover the event, we participated in it too. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. That's a sharp looking vehicle there. You know, the potential for a rail stoppage that could hit us this week has Premier Daniel Smith and NDP leader Nahed Nenshi quite concerned. Nenshi says he hopes all leaders can come to the table and work together to formulate a new deal. This is something very troubling. Like everyone, I am alarmed by the potential of an economy-wide rail stoppage with both railways. But I will also say that the best agreement is always a negotiated agreement. And I'm really encouraging all the parties to get back to the table, to get back to the table seriously, to try and avoid the stoppage on Thursday, and for the federal government to do everything in its power to make sure the parties stay at the table. The eight-day strike in 2019 ended up costing $3 billion. And when you have a day's worth of delay, it can result in several days' worth of recovery to be able to, to catch up. We also know that the longer it's closed, the more it's going to shut down businesses yeah, because you can't produce projects, uh, products just in time if you can't get them onto, a, onto freight to be able to transport it. So what would a rail stoppage look like for Lethbridge? How would it really impact us? Stacey Talp with Teamsters Local 362 says the impact felt in the Windy City would be significant. 
Well, Lethbridge is a key hub for uh, all international transport uh, w through rail east, west, north and south. I mean, it's the main switching yard here. We actually have union members working down here that it's going to affect them uh, economically. Uh, hopefully we can get some uh, progress moving forward here and it'll, it'll, it'll help the economy here in Lethbridge. Um, but it is going to affect the transportation end of it all there. So being Teamsters here, we do support uh, good collective bargaining moving forward. And I hope uh, the company will sit down with the Teamster, Teamsters Rail and, and come up with a good collective agreement where everybody is a win-win on this. Commuters in Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal could be sent scrambling for alternate routes by a pending rail strike. Transit authorities say certain commuter lines that run on CPKC tracks will be suspended if the work stoppage moves ahead. Dispatchers and thousands of other workers are set to walk off the job while the railway has pledged to lock out employees due to the deadlock negotiations. Political reporter Brian Lilly gave us his thoughts on if the federal government could potentially implement back-to-work legislation here. First off, it's going to be a lockout, not a strike. So that is the employer locking out the workers before they have a chance to get on strike. That's something that happens in certain industries. But secondly, due to a 2015 court decision that we've discussed before, when Justice Rosalia Bella said the time has come to recognize the right for uh, the right to strike be recognized in the charter, back to work legislation has effectively been illegal. It's been tried a few times, but challenged in court. Mr. Lilly will also have the latest poll numbers, which shows that the Conservatives are still well ahead of the Liberals. That's coming up after business news. Well, it's a beautiful day to kick off Whoop Up Days here in Lethbridge. Jeanette Roche, who drove our station vehicle through the parade earlier today, is still down to the grounds with a quick peek at the forecast. Jeanette, it looks like wonderful weather all week long for the annual summer festival. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a warm and sunny one for most of this five-day festival. Uh, we could see some showers as we wrap up the five days, the Web Whip Up days, uh, as we close out on Saturday there. Other than that, uh, after 8 p.m. tonight, we could see a risk of some thunderstorms and some showers developing as well. Also, some 30 to 50 kilometer per hour winds from the west. Other than that, we are seeing warmer than usual temperatures. We're definitely remaining higher than seasonal, and we're going to see some hot, sunny days for the rest of the week. So I'll be back later in the show with a look at the national and seven-day forecast. Thanks so much, Jeanette. That zipper ride takes me back to my childhood. You know, the roads heading into Jasper are open, but officials say tourists are not welcome into the Rocky Mountain town for now. Christine Nadon, the incident commander for the municipality of Jasper, says there's a large police presence in the town and officers will be patrolling for visitors asking them to leave. Superintendent Fair indicated the fire was called being held and therefore we've lifted any and all evacuation provisions for the town site a few days ago. We've also lifted the checkpoints at the entrances to Jasper this morning in conjunction with Highway 16 reopening for 24-7 travel. Having that said, uh, re-entry is for residents and business owners currently and the contractors and support services that are helping them. So Jasper is still not ready to welcome visitors. We appreciate your patience as we work to resume our services and rebuild our community. And uh, we will let you know when we're ready to accommodate visitors. There is no checkpoint at the entrance of the community, but there's strong RCMP patrol with clear directives on that front. And just a reminder to visitors that there are no hotels, there are no restaurants, there are no businesses open, and we do need the space to get our residents and our businesses uh, back on their feet. So we ask you for your kindness and respect in that. And if you do show up in town, you can expect to be intercepted by an RCMP officer. Now officials also say that the schools in Jasper are set to open in about four weeks time. When Alice Faubert entered her home in Jasper for the first time since a wildfire torched her town, the rancid smell from her fridge made it difficult to recognize where she was. Faubert was among dozens of residents who had a chance to assess the gray rubble left behind by a wildfire that destroyed a third of the town's structures almost a month ago. It was really hard walking, like driving up and seeing like the burnt trees and the, that, are, that are pretty much like toothpicks at this point. Um, but it was nice to see like the firemen and the uh, support workers that greeted us at the gates and had welcomed us into the town. You know, they were very kind to us. They were very delicate with us, very sympathetic. It feels like you kind of like lost part of like Jasper's soul, you know, like there's so many residential houses that are gone, neighborhoods that are gone, places that I had, you know, long boarded through that are just ash and rubble and it's devastating. 
With so many Canadians struggling to make ends meet these days, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation held a news conference in Calgary on Tuesday discussing the true cost of fuel taxes here in Canada. Chris Sims is the Alberta Director of the CTF and she joins us from a Calgary gas station on location to discuss this in more detail. Chris, why not break it down for us? How much do we pay in both provincial and federal taxes each time we fill up at the pumps here in Alberta? It's a different story this summer, Hal. Last summer, Albertans were paying the lowest fuel taxes in all of Canada. Unfortunately, now that crown belongs to the province of Manitoba. So here in Alberta, all tolls, hopefully you can see that there, that is 48 cents per liter of gasoline we are paying in just taxes. Now this orange one here, 13 cents per liter, that's our provincial fuel tax. That is back with a vengeance. We are paying the full freight of the provincial fuel tax here in Alberta this summer. Last summer, we were not. When you add up all of the taxes, Hal, it's 48 cents per liter of gasoline. To put that into perspective, filling up a family minivan, that's gonna cost you more than $30 just in the taxes. Pickup truck, more than $50 just in the taxes. Chris, has there been any response by the Alberta government to your suggestion that perhaps provincial fuel taxes should be paused yet again? To be fair, Premier Daniel Smith did do the right thing for an entire year. So we had the provincial fuel tax suspended here in Alberta for an entire year. It saved drivers big time money. We've also been speaking with the Premier's office and they say that they're really trying to focus hard on balancing the budget and they're promising to deliver on that big income tax cut. So if they deliver on that big income tax cut that was gonna save the average Alberta family 1,500 bucks per year, we'll be pretty happy with that. But as of this second, we're paying high fuel taxes and we haven't seen that income tax cut yet. So that's got to get going. Chris Sims, Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Thanks so much for your time today and joining us from Calgary. The war between the Israel Defense Forces and the terrorist group Hamas continues unabated. Palestinian officials say an Israeli airstrike on a school turned shelter in Gaza City killed at least 10 people. شهر 8 بداية أغسطس حتى اللحظة نتحدث عن تسعة مدارس مأهولة مدارس إيواء قصفتها قوات الاحتلال الإسرائيلي كان آخرها مدرسة التابعين واليوم تستهدف مدرسة مصطفى حافظ أيضا وهناك عدد من الشهداء Now a bomb that was meant to cause serious damage to a Tel Aviv synagogue went off prematurely preventing a number of deaths TBN Israel correspondent Yair Pinto has more Hamas and the Islamic Jihad accepted joint responsibility for this terror attack, which involved an unusually large explosive charge of 8 kilograms. They added in their announcement that they intend to continue sending terrorists to attack Tel Aviv as long as the IDF continues operations against them. On that note, there were also developments in the negotiations over a ceasefire in Gaza, while the status of Israel's remaining hostages and the IDF's increasing dominance over Hamas in the Gaza Strip are all weighing on a potential deal. The families of Hamas held hostages and their supporters gathered in Tel Aviv urging U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken to put pressure to finally reach a ceasefire deal and bring their loved ones home. And we're here to say it out loud, Blinken, Anthony Blinken, please push Netanyahu for a deal, any price, because I want my son to be free. I want my son back home. You know that only with the vast help of the American administration, a deal will come. Blinken is here to push it. We are very thankful for him. You know, harvest time is a very special time of year for farmers, and it's especially gratifying when the fruits of all of their hard work goes to support those who are less fortunate. The Coldale Lethbridge Food Grains Project held their annual harvest event at Barbecue. It took place at a field just east of Coldale, owned by George and Dorothy Matthews. Now, last year, the event raised over $150,000 for the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Organizers are confident they'll reach that mark yet again this year. BCN's Brett Brown was out at the event and has the details. Farmers from throughout the Lethbridge and Coaldale areas converged on a local field Tuesday afternoon to bring in a harvest of generosity. A total of 15 combines and 8 trucks rolled into the swaths of barley while an appreciative crowd of community members cheered them on. Chairman of the Lethbridge-Coaldale Food Grains Project, Ed 
Donkers Good, says the annual event has raised an average of $150,000 a year for the last 17 years. We basically organize a small army of uh, volunteers uh, to do every piece of the uh, preparation in the spring uh, from herbicide application and crop protection products as well as seeding and uh, irrigating and uh, taking fertilizer um, and then ultimately the combining and baling uh, of the crop at harvest time. The money raised by this local event for the Canadian Food Grains Bank will be matched by the Canadian government and used to provide food aid throughout the world. Alberta Regional Representative Abe Jansen says the Food Grains Bank was able to feed over a million people in 40 different countries thanks to harvests across Canada. Uh, about 60%, 60 percent, 60 to 70 percent of that money goes to food aid, meaning emergency food. Syria, Sudan, Gaza, those are Yemen, those are the, the, the hot, some of the hot points right now in the world where people are extremely food insecure, they're, 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 they're starving. The barley harvested from this quarter section will be sold at market value to local feed yards and livestock producers, many of whom add their own donation. Dunker's Good says he is always amazed at how much can be accomplished by a dedicated group of supporters. I wish I could bottle the, the feeling of, of joy and uh, appreciation for our community. We've got less than 200 people on an annual basis that come together and raise a small fortune. And if you think about that, that's not a large crowd of people, but it sure is a heck of a lot of money. A large crowd also turned out for a barbecue at the event sponsored by ATB. The barbecue will add another ten dollars to $20,000 to the fundraising total. For Bridge City News, I'm Brett Brown. Well, it was a gorgeous day for that food grains project out by Coaldale and the Whoop Up Days Parade here in Lethbridge. And the beautiful weather will be sticking around for the remainder of the week. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Well, we had a beautiful summer day to kick off Whoop Up Days here in Lethbridge. And Bridge City News was out at the parade earlier today, which rolled through the downtown core. Our very own Jeanette Roche drove our nicely decorated station vehicle and is down at the grounds right now. Jeanette, some good support for BCN during the parade today. Yeah, hell, we did hear a few cheers, some claps, a lot of waving arms, and even a couple of news tips along the way, but it was always a great time in that parade, as it is down here on the grounds at the Lethbridge and District Exhibition, where Boop Up Days kicked off today. Now, this evening, uh, it's hot and sunny right now, but tonight we could see a risk of some thunderstorms and uh, possibly some showers as well. Other than that, looks like a fairly warm, sunny week. As we get into Wednesday and beyond, we're seeing above seas temperatures 26 27 we're seeing 31 for Friday Saturday could bring a chance of showers but 27 degrees for the last day of the festival Sunday we're seeing 26 for our last August weekend and we could see some showers Sunday night and finally 25 degrees on Monday with a 60% chance of showers now the average high these days is 25 the average low 10 degrees this morning at 6.30, right on the nose, and it's setting 14 hours and 8 minutes later at 8.38 p.m. Did you happen to catch that blue supermoon last night? It was wild, but I, dig I digress there. Turning our attention nationally, over on the West Coast, 40% chance of showers with risk of thunderstorms in the afternoon in Victoria, 18 degrees for a high. In Vancouver, 19, with a 60% chance of showers, risk of thunderstorms in the afternoon. Edmonton, high 24, 30% chance of showers, late in the afternoon, risk of a thunderstorm. In Calgary, increasing clouds and 60% chance of afternoon showers and a risk of a thunderstorm, high 20 degrees. Risk of a thunderstorm in Saskatoon, a 60% chance of showers and 20 to 40k winds. High 25. Regina coming in at a high of 26. Wednesday, mainly cloudy skies with 60% chance of showers and a thunderstorm. Winnipeg, sunny, becoming a mix of sun and cloud with a daytime high of 27. Toronto also becoming a mix of sun and cloud near noon with 20 to 40 K winds reaching a high of 23 degrees. In Ottawa tomorrow, 18 degrees, 40% chance of showers. Montreal seeing lots of rain and an additional rainfall amount of 20 to 40 millimeters is expected beginning this evening through Wednesday morning. 
However, amounts could locally reach 50 millimeters in thunderstorms. Now, tomorrow there in Montreal, 10 millimeters more is expected. Also, a high of only 15 degrees. Those are September temperatures, folks. In Atlantic Canada, 60% chance of showers expected in Fredericton and a high of 20 degrees. Halifax, 30% chance of showers. Back up to 24 degrees there. 22 degrees in Charlottetown, 60% chance of showers there. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, no longer feeling those effects of Ernesto. St. John's, a few showers ending in the morning, then mainly cloudy skies with a high of 24. Reporting from the Whoop Up Days grounds here at Lethbridge and District Exhibition, that is your full weather forecast. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level since March of 2021. Many analysts believe this will lead to another rate cut by the Bank of Canada. Inflation is currently sitting at 2.5%. Tuesday's Consumer Price Index report says the cost for travel tours, passenger vehicles and electricity helped drive the figure lower. Shelter costs, meanwhile, are still the main driver of inflation as Canadians face higher mortgage and rent payments. The federal agency did note, however, that shelter price growth slowed last month to 5.7% year over year. That's down from 6.2% in June. A looming work stoppage at Canadian Pacific, Kansas City could disrupt the commutes of more than 32,000 people across the country. Transit authorities say select commuter lines that run on CPKC tracks in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal will be suspended if dispatchers walk off the job this week. CPKC and Canadian National Railway have both said that they will lock out employees unless a new contract is reached. The Teamsters Canada Rail Conference has also threatened to strike. A phased shutdown of both networks is already underway and a full-fledged halted rail traffic could begin soon as well. Hundreds of Canadian employees at Skip the Dishes and its parent company are being laid off. The chief executive of the food delivery service says 100 Skip the Dishes workers and about 700 Canadian staff for its owner, JustEatTakeaway.com, will lose their jobs. Paul Burns says the cuts are the result of a comprehensive review and restructure. Winnipeg founded Skip the Dishes was acquired in December of 2016 by Just Eat, which merged with the Dutch company Takeaway.com back in 2020. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 78 points on the day to finish at 23,037. The Dow was down 61 points to 40,834. The S&P 500 was down 11 on the day to 55.97 and the Nasdaq was up 245 points to 17,876. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 33 cents to 74.04 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 5 cents to 220 US. Gold was up 982 on the day to 25.13.85 US an ounce and silver was down 2 cents to 29.43 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.35 per bushel, barley's at $5.44, canola's at $13, and corn is at $7 per bushel. Live cattle were down $1.78 to $1.8103, feeder cattle were down $4.18 to $2.3820, and lean hogs October contract was up $0.90 cents to $87.33. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $73.40 US. Recapping one of our top stories, Whoop Up Days kicked off in Lethbridge with the annual Whoop Up Days Parade of which BCN was a part of. The annual summer festival, now over 100 years old, continues until Saturday at the Lethbridge and District Exhibition Grounds. There are lots of games, rides, a rodeo, dancing, great music, and of course a wonderful parade earlier today. Now last year we had around 77,000 visitors, organizers are hoping to top that number this year. We could potentially see a national rail strike here in Canada. Now, will the federal government invoke back-to-work legislation? Political commentator and reporter Brian Lilly will give us his thoughts momentarily. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. The threat of a potential rail strike is many Canadians worried, especially us here in Western Canada, since so much of our grain is transported by train. It would also negatively impact our oil and gas sector. Now to chat about this in more detail is Sun Political columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, is the Trudeau government doing anything to help avoid a strike or lockout? 
Well, I mean, they're talking to all the parties involved, and this is an odd year, Hal. You've got both uh, CPKC and CN Rail um, facing potential strikes, lockouts, essentially. At the same time, they normally have their contracts staggered, and you'll forgive me, I forget which one extended their contract um, by a year during the pandemic, and so now they're up for... Um, uh, renewal at the same time. Normally they're staggered and if one goes on strike, well then you can shove as much uh, you know, goods onto the other train uh, system as you can. Now it's both at the same time and this is showing how important the rail industry is to Canada. Billion dollars a day worth of goods moves across the country and you're right, a lot of grain, a lot of oil. I saw those trains when I was uh, out in Sask recently driving uh, down Highway 11 out of Saskatoon. Lots of huge trains. I know you experienced them throughout Alberta as well, but it's straight across the country. I mean, you've got the Canadian Federation of Independent Business saying how worried they are, because if you're a, a small business that, you know, let's say you're retail and you're importing things, whether it's from Asia or Europe, a lot of that's going to come in by ship and then move across this country by rail. If you are a, a meat producer, you're going to ship it from your plant to the port to export it by rail, everybody's going to be impacted by this. So what's the Trudeau government doing it? Uh, doing Well, Labour Minister Steve McKinnon is trying to talk to the parties involved, try to say, hey, look, come to an agreement, offering arbitration. One thing that he can't do now, and or he could try, but it would be unsuccessful, is back-to-work legislation. I've heard people say they've got to bring in back-to-work legislation. First off, it's going to be a lockout, not a strike. So that is the employer locking out the workers before they have a chance to get on strike. That's something that happens in certain industries. But secondly, due to a 2015 court decision that we've discussed before, when Justice Rosalia Bella said the time has come to recognize the right for uh, the right to strike be recognized in the charter, back to work legislation has effectively been illegal. It's been tried a few times, but challenged in court. So uh, hopefully if there is a strike, it's very short. Uh, in, in duration, but let's hope that all sides, and it's not just both sides here, let's hope all sides are able to come to an agreement. Otherwise, an awful lot of commerce will come to a grinding, screeching halt as the train tries to stop in time. Brian, the Liberal government is promising to fix the temporary foreign workers program, which many say has simply gotten out of control. Now, you say it is problematic due to changes the federal government made, what, two years ago? Yeah, April 2022, uh, just less than two weeks after they signed their uh, coalition agreement with the NDP, the party of the worker, well, the Trudeau Liberals brought in these changes that raised caps. There used to be a cap of you couldn't have more than 10% of your uh, employees come through the temporary foreign worker program. It's to protect jobs for Canadians and not just have you say, well, we'll send across to whatever country, pay them cheaper wages, and, and have them come into Canada. By the way, this is all separate from the Agricultural Foreign Workers Program, which is a very different one. This is low wage uh, positions. These are working in hotels and restaurants, in some cases outside of the low wage area, such as construction. But they, they got rid of those 10% caps, moved it to 20% for most industries, but then in construction, healthcare, nursing homes, food and accommodation services, they said you could have 30% of your workforce come from the temporary foreign worker program. They made other changes as well, such as if unemployment goes above 6%, there used to be restrictions that would come in. They got rid of those. They, they, they changed the program so much, they effectively put it on steroids. And now you've got a rising unemployment rate, you've got uh, a lot of complaints uh, of people saying this simply isn't fair. Mike Moffat, a uh, liberal, um, worked with the Liberal Party at one point, worked with the, the Trudeau government, an academic, an economist. He said this is a wage suppression move, and he's been very critical of the government. Despite being aligned with the Trudeau government many times in the past, he's calling this wage suppression and says it has to stop. I don't think he's wrong. Now, there's been a lot of online concern by many who say that Tim Hortons is being overly reliant on the temporary foreign workers program, Brian. You say, however, it's not just Timmy's, but a liberal MP has even used the program? Yeah, look, I, I understand people looking for a, a villain in this, and so they're picking on Tim Hortons. And Tim Hortons, by the way, it, most of them are franchised, and, and so people are applying for what's called a labor market impact assessment, 
That's the document the federal government says, you're right, you can't find a Canadian to do the job. You can bring in people from out of the country. Looks like some Tim Hortons, but also others in the food and retail industry are becoming overly reliant on this. But an astute reader of mine pointed out, you got to check out Liberal MP Sukhdaliwal. He's an MP from Surrey, British Columbia. Before going into politics, he started and still owns a, a land surveying company. It's called Dollywall and Associates Land Surveying. Um, they promote on their website that, you know, they're run by Sukh Dollywall, Liberal MP, and he was approved for legal assistant, um, uh, you know, legal administrative assistant, sorry, is the full term, uh, and, and recently hired someone on this. So this is a very widespread program. And at a time when we have rising unemployment, a housing crisis, a healthcare crisis because we don't have full access to the medical facilities that we need or care that we need, how, how much sense does it bring in? Uh, how much sense does it make to bring in so many people at once into the country? But you could say that writ large about the entire Trudeau immigration program. The prime minister has even said that it reduces and suppresses wages. And he says that, you know, it's it's a problem. We're bringing in people faster than we can absorb. If only he knew someone who could do something about this, Hal. But the liberals are walking around talking about this program being problematic and not acknowledging that they're the ones that caused the problem or that they're the ones that could fix it. Do you think maybe the liberals are thinking more of an open door policy when it comes to the temporary foreign workers, that maybe some of those foreign workers from other countries could be votes for the Liberal Party? Well, it would still, you know, un under the current system, it would still be several years before they could be voters. And I've heard, you know, that's been the response of a lot of critics online. They reply to me and they say, well, they're just importing their next voting base for the next election. It still takes three years at this point, minimum, most five, to become a citizen. And that's still what you need to vote. So under the current system, they couldn't. Now, are they open to an open border policy? It would seem that because look at Mark Miller's responses when asked about the the, the large increase in the number of temporary residents. He said, well, if it's problematic, what, why don't we just make them permanent? Uh, okay, well, then you've allowed them to jump the queue because you've still got a ton of people trying to come in from the regular system who are waiting in line, following the rules. If you don't think that what the Liberals are doing now uh, is aggravating the immigrant community in Canada, then you don't know the immigrant community. And, and I actually don't think the Liberal government does as much as they will talk about it. This will irritate people. The people that lined up, followed the rules, did what they were supposed to do to come to Canada, to be Canadian, they're going to look at this and say, well, why Why are you just opening the doors? Why, why did I bother following the rules and take years and jump through hoops? I could have just done this. Brian, speaking of folks who are irritated, there's a lot of anger this week when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that former radio and TV host Charles Adler was appointed to the Senate. Now, it's led to calls for the Senate to be reformed or even abolished, but you say that ain't happening. It, I mean, theoretically, it can be done. Realistically, good luck. Uh, so we all know that the, you know, if you want to abolish the Senate, what do you have to do? You have to get a constitutional amendment. If you want to reform the Senate in any meaningful way, make it what Alberta's long called for, elected, effective, and equal, or I guess it was equal, elected, and effective. Um, if you want to do that, you need a constitutional reform. Stephen Harper tried many ways to use legislation, um, to use convention, to try and change things. And in 2014, the Supreme Court said, no, any of these things you want to do, like electing senators and making that stick, that has to have a constitutional amendment. And by the way, there have been five elected senators from Alberta appointed, one by Brian Mulroney, four by Stephen Harper. You'll notice that when the Liberals are in power, they don't appoint elected senators. So you need to put it into law or a change to make that happen. And the Supreme Court says you need to do that with a constitutional amendment. So abolish or reform, you need to amend the Constitution. That requires seven provinces covering 50% of the population. Even if you could get that, what happens as soon as you open up the Constitution? Quebec sticks up their hand and says, oh, we want to insert a bunch more things for us. Alberta would say, we want the Alberta Sovereignty Act recognized. Saskatchewan would say, me too. And then every Indigenous group across the country would be saying, you know what, we've got some ideas of what we want in there. You know, you can't just open it up for this one thing. I do not see that happening. Um, every time it's talked about for whatever reason to change the constitution for one item 
everybody else says, oh no, not one item. We've got a whole laundry list of things to change. And at that point, it becomes unworkable. Now, Brian, a group of Manitoba Indigenous leaders is calling for the Prime Minister to rescind Charles Adler's appointment uh, based on comments he made, what, around 15 years ago? What did he say? He was talking about uh, an issue uh, surrounding certain chiefs, and he referred to the chiefs as boneheads. Um, and, and people are saying, well, that's racist and you can't do that. Well, if he's talking about the actions of the chiefs, you know, if you can't call a chief a bonehead, why can you call the prime minister a bonehead or a premier a bonehead? Uh, you don't get an automatic pass being a political leader just because of your race. And so I know this will upset some people because I know I've heard from people. They don't want Charles Adler in the Senate and he's a sellout now and he's a, a Trudeau uh, hack. That's all fair. But I'm sure if you looked at the full context of the comments, which were complained about, went to an arbitrator and they said, no, this is all fair comment. That's not going to get Adler tossed. I'm not sure anything will. Um, I think Trudeau is going to stick by him. We've seen how bad you have to be for Justin Trudeau to rescind your appointment. We've seen that just recently with the guy who he wanted to head up the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I, I don't see this being enough, but you know, as soon as I saw it, and, and full disclosure, I used to work with Charles Adler. We were at Sun News mm -hmm. Network together, um, as were you. Uh, he was a columnist for the, the, the Sun newspapers across the country. It was on his radio program many times. Uh, but, you know, he has changed his politics completely, and he absolutely became a Trudeau cheerleader. But I'm betting most of the, uh, the people who don't want him in the Senate now would probably agree with the comments they're complaining about from 15 years ago. Ryan, the Trudeau government has been thinking of revoking the citizenship of a man who was arrested in a terror plot and is alleged to have been featured in an ISIS torture video. Now, didn't Trudeau once say a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian? Not only did he say that, but he said terrorists should keep their Canadian citizenship. He was that blunt. He said that in Winnipeg uh, ahead of the 2015 election. And then, yeah, he said many times a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. And so when Mark Miller, the immigration minister, started talking about revoking this gentleman's citizenship, his name is uh, Ahmed Aldidi, uh, people said, oh, so I guess a Canadian isn't a Canadian is a Canadian. And I said, no, wait a minute. I know the answer to this. Because there's a famous clip, and I was sharing it last week, lots of people were, of the Monk foreign policy debate in the 2015 election. Stephen Harper had passed a law that said if you are a dual citizen and you take up arms against Canada, you can be stripped of your Canadian citizenship if you're convicted of doing so. That's when Trudeau said a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. So I'm at the debate, and I asked him afterwards, I said, you know, going back to your father's time, Canada has tried to deport Nazi war criminals. We're trying to do it right now. What's the difference? And he said, they lied on their application. So it's not what they did. It's that the paperwork was incorrect, Hal. They didn't follow the right process. They, 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 didn't, uh, they lied on the application. To, to Justin Trudeau, that's worse than the act of taking up arms against Canada or being involved in an ISIS torture video or you know, allegedly being involved in a terror plot. All those things are, are, are fine. Lying on your application, that's a bridge too far. And if you do that, Justin Trudeau wants you kicked out of the country. There's a little bit of an embarrassing moment for Conservative leader Pierre Polyev. His team released a video about the Canadian dream, but they had to delete it. And it turns out some of the visuals were anything but Canadian. Yeah, and this is unfortunate because some of the visuals were fighter jets, which apparently were Russian fighter jets. And of course, the Liberals always trying to link Pierre Polyev in any way to Donald Trump. And of course, in the States, they say Donald Trump is, uh, the Democrats say Donald Trump is a tool of Russia, doesn't support Ukraine, uh, he's friends with Vladimir Putin. So they're trying to do that now. A bit of an own goal for, own goal for Polyev's department. They've been very slick with their video production for a long time. They've been very good at using visual mediums and sharing it, whether it's an ad on TV, which they've run, including the Tent City ad recently, or whether it's uh, you know social media videos, they're very good at using the medium. Somebody wasn't paying attention here. They got caught. The liberals saw it, pounced on it right away. You know, it, it's not going to be a huge thing, but it's a distraction, and it allows the, the liberal 
um, haters of Polyev, of which there are many, to, to point at him, giggle, make accusations that he's in bed with Putin as well. Now, will that recent slip up change voters' minds, or do the Tories still have a commanding lead at the polls? Oh, still a commanding lead. Um, the latest abacus poll is a 20 point lead, 43% uh, to 23% for the Liberals. Um, Leger has it 41% to 23. Nanos, it's a bit smaller. It's a 14 to 16 point gap. He does a, a weekly tracking poll and it's been in that range. So, you know, if liberals want to say, oh, look, we're just at a 14.5% gap now, we're closing in on them. That's still a massive majority. If Pierre Polyev beat the liberals by 14.5%, that's a massive majority. Uh, some of the polling, both Leger, Leger shows the conservatives gaining in Quebec, but not in the lead. Abaca shows the conservatives in the lead in Quebec. It's harder once you get down to regional numbers, but everywhere in the country, the conservatives are doing much better. The liberals are doing much worse. And, and the underlying factors, you know, they, they don't help the liberals come back. Uh, Canadians no longer trust the liberals on the issues that matter right now. We're a long way away from an election. Remember what I always say, Hal? Voters are fickle. Polls can change. Campaigns matter. But if the vote were held right now, it'd be a massive conservative majority. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today from Toronto. Thank you, Hal. Albertans should be able to feel safe in their homes and communities, whether they live in a big city or a rural area. But over the last number of years, we've been hearing a lot of complaints about increasing rural crime. However, today's guest has some encouraging news in this area. Joining us is RCMP Superintendent Mike McCulley from the Community Safety and Wellbeing Branch. Welcome to Bridge City News, Mike. Great to have you on today. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Okay, so tell us about the good news here. Apparently, rural crime in most of southern Alberta has actually decreased since 2023. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I looked at the numbers again. I, it's funny because in my branch, I'm, I'm in charge of crime reduction, and we focus more on offenders. We focus more on the root causes of crime versus the numbers. Uh, of course, the numbers are important. They, they do tell a story, but there's so little we can control about that. Uh, but it is extremely positive to hear that uh, many of the main drivers of crime in uh, rural Alberta, and, and especially in southern Alberta, uh, have decreased. Uh, break and enters are down 18% uh, over the same period of last year. Uh, theft of motor vehicles are down around 22%, and theft of over 5,000 down around 17%. So those are very encouraging numbers. That is really encouraging. I know, like, I was looking at some stats as well from what you guys, RCMP, are saying. So from January to March, it looks like compared to the same period last year, there have been even, like, fewer person crime offenses, person against person, I guess that is, what, 76 less, 213 fewer property crimes, and 373 less total criminal code offenses. And like you said, break and enters dropped 18.4% in vehicles. So what do you think is leading to this, this wonderful news that, that it's kind of, we're seeing this significant decrease? Yeah, so there's a few things I'll speak to. Um, it's, uh, to be completely blunt, uh, there's not a lot we can do to control the numbers we we you know there there's there's work we can do to again we tackle the root causes of crime we tackle the root causes of victimization and i think and i'll share some of that um and all we can do is do the best we can in those areas and to provide the most programming uh, to to help albertans and to to try and counteract this but um i can tell you that uh, in the last five years there's actually been a around 33 percent drop in uh, those key property crime uh, areas in in, uh, in southern Alberta, uh, which is which is massive. And in 2020, they created the position I'm in now. I wasn't the original original uh, member in that position, but uh, they created the the crime reduction strategy uh, uh, portion uh, of, uh, of of policing in Alberta, and they really put a focus on rural crime and a focus on on tackling those root causes. And we saw a major decrease that first year year and a half. Um, and then it, it steady, leveled off a little bit. And uh, in uh, two, two years ago, we created the Community Safety Wellbeing Branch, which is an even more enhanced, um, robust strategy when it comes to tackling these issues. And uh, we're starting to see the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I will give a lot of credit to the frontline members uh, because the hardworking frontline members, if, if they're not there to to do the the policing, um, none of this matters. None of the programming we, we can create from a headquarters perspective um, and a strategy perspective works without those hardworking, dedicated frontline members and our community partners that embrace it. Yeah, exactly. Now, is this the first significant decrease that we've seen in Southern Alberta rural crime in several years, or has it been sort of declining for some time now, or do you really attribute it to sort of what what you guys are doing, just the difference that that's made? Well, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to take some credit. Of course. Uh, in, <laughs> yeah, in in the provincial RCMP uh, realm. Again, it's been a big focus for the last five years, and uh, and we have seen the gains in the last five years. But it is very promising. Uh, these specific stats that uh, that brought us here today, it's very promising, and we're going to hopefully continue that trend. Um, the biggest shift we've had, especially in the last, I'll say, year and a half, is is again to to develop stronger partnerships. Uh, we have partnerships with. Uh, Nonprofit agencies. We have partnerships with community groups. We have partnerships with uh, AHS um, to tackle uh, drug addiction, to tackle mental health, um, and and to really again focus on the root causes. Because what we found is that it's all fine. You know, yes, police have a role to arrest uh, people that commit crimes, uh, and and we're we're happy to do that, uh, and and we do it well. But what we've had to shift from, and and it is a shift. It's, I would say it's a, a relatively global shift is to not just tackle that, but also to walk upstream. So we use the stream analogy. If you, if you picture us, uh, a beautiful stream, and you know, coming down, uh, down your screen there, at the bottom is where we pick people up and have to arrest them, have to, or perhaps they're, they're in, in the depths of uh, drug addiction, and that's why they're committing crimes. Um, and, and often our social services and police and first responders deal with people at their worst at the bottom of that stream. What we've tried to do is how about we walk upstream and find out why they're falling in and uh, ending up in that sad uh, state of affairs at the end of that cesspool uh, and, and, and try and work on some of those reasons before we get there. And I think there's been some good success. That's, that sounds really practical too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things is when you start doing it, it's like, yeah, of course I can, I can keep the cycle going and, and arresting and, and the person gets, uh, you know, back on the streets. And if we don't give them support and services for, again, addiction is a big driver of crime. If we don't try and partner and, and find the most, uh, as you said, common sense and, and realistic solutions for these folks to break that cycle, um, then we're just going to be keeping the same, the same uh, methods going and it's probably not going to have any success. Yeah, revolving door for sure. I, I would imagine that one of the challenges for policing is the huge geographical areas that RCMP have to cover. And, uh, you know, of course, slow response times sometimes can come along with that. So uh, would more officers obviously would be helpful, right? But that normally isn't the various, it, it's not usually in the budget, right? The, for the government budget to increase the, the fleet. So have we seen any increases in the number of officers in rural areas or not? Yeah, so with uh, in recent years, uh, there's a, a thing, and I won't bore you with the details, but called the police funding model. So in, in uh, smaller communities have had to change their, their funding structure to, to pay and contribute towards policing. And what that's done is it's given us, uh, you know, an, an increase in resources. There has been, over the last uh, four years, there has been an increase. It's not, it's not as simple as putting a police officer on every corner. Um, that just doesn't work, to be honest. It's it's about coming up with an overall strategy to increase numbers where they are needed 100% in the front lines, but also to come up with supports and different strategies. So I'll give an example is um, is the crime reduction units that exist. So Southern Alberta and every other RCMP district has a crime reduction unit where their focus is on uh, the highest, uh, the, the, high, the, the criminals that create the most amount of harm for their communities. Um, and having a team like that, what we've found is uh, you take the the top, say, 10, or in, in our case, we deal with the top 100 offenders in the province. And, of course, there are some in southern Alberta. If, if we focus our energy on those folks, um, it can actually reduce crime a great deal because it's not just catching someone who's maybe, you know, stealing a loaf of bread. It's uh, going and, t and trying to 
capture and, and keep in jail those folks that are causing an enormous amount of harm in communities. Um, our studies have found, and we use we use the crime severity index as a as a measuring stick uh, for our top 100 offenders. And uh, and yes, there's the violent offenders that might commit one crime, you know, uh, one heinous crime, and that obviously raises their stats. But we have people that that commit over and over again robberies and break and enters and domestic violence, and it's a repeat, as you said, like the revolving doors type of system. We're focusing on those folks um, in addition to responding to calls and doing other preventive policing. But by responding or by focusing on those folks, if we take them off the street and and you know spend some more time uh, building bail packages and, and building uh, uh, assistance for the Crown to tr- hopefully get those folks held in jail longer and, and get longer sentencing, then we're actually preventing a lot more crime than we are if we just kind of take a shotgun approach and, and try and uh, try and tackle all of the problems that exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to, to like the crime of theft or property theft, are there any specific items that thieves are targeting? Is it mainly machinery and, and vehicles or what are you seeing sort of in those rural areas? I don't know if there's any specific things. What I will say is that vehicles are a huge problem in Alberta, a step to vehicles. We do a lot of programming. Uh, in the wintertime, we do Project Cold Start, which is focusing on the fact that uh, people leave their vehicles running and uh, go into stores. But outside of that, and especially in rural communities, um, folks will leave their keys on their, on their dashboard or leave them under their visor um, and leave the car unlocked. Uh, 50% of vehicles are found to be stolen with the keys in the car. Uh, you know, that is a massive number. So, um, yes, you know, most of the time criminals are doing crimes of opportunity. So, yes, they'll go onto a rural property and they'll see what's out and about. If there's a shed open, that's where they're going to tackle uh, looking for items and they'll take whatever's available. So, it is about target hardening, it is about taking some extra steps. Uh, my uncle lives has a beautiful ranch in Okotoks in southern Alberta, and we tr- we travel and visit him often. And, and I'm always telling him, and I think of him as our other great Albertans uh, down south, is saying, yes, you have a beautiful community here, but people will potentially come and and look and see, uh, you know, if if your if your door is locked, or look and see if your vehicles are locked, and if the keys are there, that's what they're going to target. If not, they'll move on to the next property. So there is a lot of steps we can take to, to try and prevent that. Definitely. I think rural residents probably don't have that tendency to lock up things as diligently as, as city dwellers do, do they? Yeah, 100%. And, and I, I love that about uh, about rural Alberta and, and, and rural Canada. Canada is a safe place. Let's, let's be very honest about this. It's a safe place. However, there's going to be people that will disrupt that piece. Uh, and small steps like locking your your doors at night, closing your garage, locking up your sheds, that does do a massive amount of prevention when it comes to uh, to rural crime. Mm-hmm. And I understand that roughly half of rural crimes happen between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., right? So can you maybe tell us about something called the 9 p.m. routine? Yeah, so a, a 9 p.m. routine, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to my, my uncle, uh, you know, we, when we go to visit him with my kids, we go and do chores. You know, the, the rural crime chore or the rural property chores that you have to do, whether it's feeding animals, whether it's, you know, just, just taking care of the property. My suggestion to all rural Albertans and all Albertans, to be honest, is at that time when you're doing your nightly chores, uh, do those extra steps. Like make sure that you leave lights on in strategic areas that you typically do. Make sure you lock up, lock up the barn if you have uh, expensive equipment in there. Lock your vehicles up. Um, you know, if you have surveillance cameras, make sure that they're turned on and they're they're active and, and working. Uh, close your doors. Do do those little things. Um, if you drive by your neighbor's house, you know, in the middle of the night and you see that their garage is open, you know, make a quick phone call and get them to close it. Right. All of those little steps truly will make neighborhoods uh, safer and, and you'll be less likely to be victimized. Yeah, that kind of comes back to that rural crime watch, almost like the neighborhood watch. Right. Yep, hundred percent, and that's the bring up a great partner of ours. The Rural Crime Watch is a great partner. We have Citizens on Patrol as partners. All of these things, I call them force multipliers. Police can't be on every corner, as we've said. Um, so if you have the more eyes and ears that are out there, is is absolutely to our benefit, and it prevents crime, but it also it can provide intelligence. So we truly encourage 
every Alberta. If you see something even remotely suspicious, call us, please. Maybe it's nothing this time, but maybe maybe uh, it uh, will lead us to understanding more trends and more patterns, um, and allow us to to better better serve uh, the communities and, and better prevent crime. Mm -hmm. Now, over the years, of course, there's been a lot of debate and controversy over what rural property owners can and can't do to protect themselves. So, what are the rules, especially when it comes to using? say, firearms or some other kind of force to protect your own home? So I'll be completely frank. I get this question a lot, and I, I, I'm not going to get into the specific rules and intricacies. Every situation is different, mm -hmm. but I will give advice. Okay. I'm good at giving advice. Um, my advice is 100%, and, and you bring up a good point for firearms. Uh, when we talk about the 9 o'clock rule, we talk about target hardening. Um, I'm actually in the middle of starting a program uh, that's going to be coming through in the near future about uh, like an education program on firearms. We understand Albertans uh, have a right to, to firearms and, and we, we don't want to get in the way of that, but we do ask Albertans to lock those up. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of crime guns that are stolen from good, uh, hardworking uh, rural Albertans. That, that have guns for proper purposes, but they get stolen because you know they don't necessarily lock them up properly. Um, so that is a, a, an item that is important. Now, getting back to your question, because I'm not dodging your question. Um, my advice is this: you you are there's nothing on your property that's worth yourself or your family members getting hurt for. Um, there's just not. So uh, you know if you have an op option to flee, if you have an option to to get out of any situation. Whether, whether that's on a rural property, whether that's on a city property, whether that's in a, in a storefront where you are observing crime, leave, leave the crime fighting to the professionals. Uh, we're trained, we have proper tools, um, you know, and, and that's, that's just that. At the end of the day, I can't get into specifics. There's so much nuance to what, you, what, what could get you in trouble or not get in trouble. Um, but I'll say there's very few chances that you won't have to escape and, and uh, you know, the, the fight or flight, uh, when it comes to a criminal on your property, it should be flight. You should be trying to get out of there with your family and loved ones as safely as possible um, and avoid any confrontation with, uh, with any, any people that are on your property for legal purposes. All right. Well, great advice there. Thanks so much for being with us today, Mike. Looks like we're out of time, but appreciate having you on today. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Mike McCauley is the superintendent with the Alberta RCMP Community Safety and Wellbeing Branch. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.